my name is Hena and um, I work as a senior research data officer within the research data management section uh, based at University of Essex. And as you're aware that uh, I'm going to talk you through to the copyright issues in secondary data use. So in this session, I'll focus on intellectual property rights, specifically copyright in the context of research. Um, I'll begin by explaining briefly what secondary data is, which is then followed by discussing what rights might there be in research. And um, I'll also discuss some issues that are very important in this context, such as licensing, um, establishing right ownership challenges in sharing social media data, and national variation in copyright. And I'll also discuss some best practice tips to ensure rights compliance when it comes to sharing your data for future reuse. And um, uh, finally, I'll point you to the resources that may be useful and I will answer your questions at the end um, if you put them in the Q&A box. If there are any specific project related questions, you can always email us. Uh, I'll add my email address as well on the last slide. So, IP rights are the rights that are granted to creators of works that are the result of human intellectual cre creativity. Um, something that is created using your mind. For example, a story, an invention, an artistic work, or even a symbol. Types of IP rights include trademarks, uh, which is a type of IP uh, right uh, consisting of a recognizable sign, design, or expression um, that identifies products or services of a particular source from those of others. Uh, patent is another type of IP. Uh, it is an exclusive right granted for an invention, and um, then registered design protects only the shape or appearance of a product. It gives its owner the exclusive right to the design of that product. And uh, finally, the copyright, which is the protection offered for creative works such as books, music, and literary works. And um, you get some types of protection automatically and others you have to apply for. And we will be focusing on copyright today. So, Let's begin with what secondary data is. Unlike primary data, which is collected by a researcher directly from the original source, um, secondary data is an existing data gathered from studies, surveys, experiments that have been run by other people or for other research. For example, existing data available at archives or from government organizations, essays, reviews, information available on social media data. So a quick question uh, before I go further, have you used secondary data or plant uses? You, you can just answer in a chat box if you like to share. Yep, so there is one person who have used it now. That's great, majority of you have said yes. So I hope that today's workshop will be helpful for you if you if you are using it or you have uh, you are planning to use it. So that's that's great. Yep, so you haven't used it, but you plan to create fantastic. I hope it will be very timely for you to attend this workshop in terms of copyright ownership, licensing issues. That's right. Thank you very much for sharing. So two most relevant types of rights applicable to the secondary data sources are copyrights and database rights. But I will be focusing on copyright in today's session. Um, I have given a link at the bottom for database rights for you to have a look at it later. There is information on our uh, 
website on database rights because it is beyond the scope of this session to cover both today. So copyright is an intellectual property right assigned automatically to the work's creator. It prevents unauthorized copying and publishing of an original work and the creator is automatically the first copyright owner unless there is a contract that assigns copyright differently or there is written transfer of copyright signed by the copyright owner. And um, that's very important um, to bear in mind that the creator is the copyright owner unless it has been agreed um, that someone else owns the copyright. It, um, it can vary nationally, but under the UK Copyright Designs and Patents Act 19, um, 188 copyright applies to original, literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works, sound recordings, films, bro broadcasts, or cable programs, or the typographical arrangement of publications or databases. Um, in the UK, copyright arises automatically once a work is created, and to enjoy copyright protection, the work must be original. That is to say, it must be your own work, not copied from someone else. And there is no copyright in ideas or facts, only in the way those ideas are expressed, such as diagrams, tables, and so on. So, as researchers when you need to obtain copyright clearance this is this is the main question so bear in mind that you do not need copyright clearance if you incorporate the factual data in your own words in a structure owned by yourself you may not need to obtain permission if you are making a copy and utilizing that copy for your own research as long as it is not made available to others or citing from the research data. However, you do need copyright clearance if you are going to include the secondary data in a publication or plan to share their data with other people. It also applies to incorporating secondary data in your own database that you intend to share with others. So uh, that's the main point that if you are using any information, any data for your own use, that should be fine. But if you are to share this information, for um, future research, for future reuse, then you do need copyright clearance. There may be other arising um, legal issues, for example, where personal data is concerned, not only the permission from the person who has created the work is required, but permission from all the people whose personal data is in the work is required. For example, um, one example could be the diary data. So copyright and um, uh, research data is a complicated topic. However, I've tried to highlight some important issues uh, in the following set section. Um, when it comes to data sharing, researchers need to keep in mind certain issues such as licensing frameworks, rights ownership, challenges when using um, social media data and um, national variation. So IP, uh, rights affect the way both you and others can use your and others research data and these issues should be considered at the outset of any research project. So you need to consider copyright when the data is created, shared and reused. For example, um, when you create a data and plan to make it available for future use, then um, you need to consider how you want your data to be made available and here the role of licensing comes in. If you are sharing your primary data, then you need to consider about which license to choose from. On the other hand, if you are using secondary data, then you need to pay attention to the licenses under which that data is available. Data collections can be available broadly under two types of licenses, open licenses and bespoke licenses. And um, as the name implies, open license um, is a standardized way to grant people permission to use the data openly. 
for example, the most widely used open license framework is the Creative Common License Framework. And um, Creative Common License Framework offer different options. And three of these have been listed here. The first one, which is CC BY, is the most widely used license. As you can see that you are allowed to use and share the data. You can create some derivation with it, adapt it as you require, publish your derived data as long as you acknowledge the original data source. And it also allows a commercial use, uh, for example, for non-academic purposes. The only condition is that the credit must be given to the creator. For example, you have downloaded a data set which is available under CC BY. You are allowed to use it for your own analysis. You can create your own data set using few variables from the original data or as many variables you need. And you are allowed to share your data for future use by giving proper attribution to the original source. And uh, you can make your data available under any other license that seems appropriate to you. So the second one is CC by share alike, and it is exactly similar to CC by apart from one condition that any adaptations must be shared under the same license. So your data should be made available as CC by share alike. The final one is the CC by a non-commercial, which has again the similar conditions, except that it cannot be used commercially. So you need, uh, to pay attention to the licenses under which the secondary data is available, what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do. And um, when you made your primary data available, then you also have to choose from these uh, licenses, which license you think is most appropriate for your data. However, most of the data made available through responsible repositories such as us is um, made available under bespoke licenses as um, there may be a residual risk of disclosure in data. For example, data owner might have removed any identifiable information, but there might be any information left in the data which if combined with other information may disclose someone's identity. So the conditions associated to these bespoke licenses ensures that researchers act responsibly and ethically with, with the data. So UK Data Service and User License Agreement is one of the examples of the bespoke licenses. Um, if you plan to use secondary data, always make sure that you are familiar with the terms and conditions under which the data is made available. So here, just a quick um, info on our licensing framework. Uh, here uh, at UK Data Service, we facilitate three levels of access for data, open access, safeguarded access, and controlled access. Open access for data that contain no personal information. Safeguarded is for the data that contain no personal information, but the data owner considers a risk of disclosure resulting from linkage to other data, or maybe when you combine some pieces of information, there, there is a risk of identifying someone. And um, this is available under end user license and users need to register to access this data. And users also need to agree to certain conditions such as not to disclose any identifying information if found. And the last one is controlled access, which is for the data that may be disclosive. And this data is only available to users who have been trained and accredited and their data usage has been approved by the relevant data access committee and access could be through a virtual or physical secure environment. So yeah, the next section is about um, establishing the right ownership in research. So there, there is a quick, um, uh, quiz on the Mentimeter. I'll share the Mentimeter link. So the first question is, what do you think? Who owns the right here? Is it the university employee or it depends? Yeah. 
So in any context, just bear in mind that IP ownership will depend on national law and individual institutions policies, and it may vary from country to country. So some of you have said university and majority of you says it depends. So yeah, I think um, it depends. Is the, the, there is no right or wrong answer. So as a general rule, the copyright in a work is initially owned by the works creator, but this is not always the case. If a work is created by an employee in the course of his or her employment, the employer owns the right unless otherwise agreed upon differently. So many universities or research centers claim ownership of any IP that is generated by academic staff in the course of their employment. And also when IP is created using substantial institutional resources. So yeah, so it could be the university or it depends, whatever has been agreed uh, between the researcher employee and the organization. So yeah, that's right. Thank you. Then who owns the right when it comes to the students? Again, it depends. Yep, yeah, there is no right or wrong answer. So it could be university, it could be student, uh, or um, of course it depends what has been agreed upon. Uh, most universities recognize as a general principle that students who are not employees of the university own the IP rights in the works they produce purely based on knowledge received from lectures and teaching. However, there may be some circumstances where ownership has to be shared or assigned to the university or a third party. And uh, typically these include sponsors, students, uh, students working on research thesis or publication in collaboration with academic staff. So it, it always depends what has been agreed um, at the onset of the research. So it could be a university, it could be a student, especially the self-funded students own the copyright and uh, it, of course it depends. So, what do you think who owns the right? Is it the research funder? Is it researcher or it depends? Yeah, again, no right or wrong answer. It could be a research funder, it could be a researcher and yes, it depends what has been agreed upon. Some research funders, they, they do wish to exert some claim over rights. Um, although in most cases, IP rights are attributed to the researcher unless an output becomes commercially viable. So yeah, um, thank you very much for your responses. I'll, I'll try to open a link and show you some of the data collections that has been deposited with us. I hope you can see that. This is one of the data collections that has been deposited with us. And here you can see that there are um, one, two, three, five data creators. The access level has been selected as safeguarded access because maybe there, there is um, uh, some disclosure risk, risk in the data. And then in terms of the copyright, you can see that there is just one person, A Heath, uh, this one, University of Oxford. This person is the copyright owner, then University of Wales and University of Oxford among this list. So this has been agreed uh, that these will be um, the joint copyright holders of the data. So it depends um, what has been agreed at the time. And then there is another example this is another collection in our catalog. Here you can see that uh, this is also, the access is uh, selected as safeguarded. And then there are, these are the data creators. This one is the dep uh, depositor. And uh, I'm just going to the copyright. So 
all of these from the data created li list um, No, this is, I, I was looking at the citation, sorry. So the, the there is just one person um, from the University of uh, Sheffield and another person from King's College from the long list. They jointly hold the copyright of this collection. So the point is just to show you that it depends um, what has been agreed. So the best practice uh, is to find out the ownership as soon as possible. And then there is another thing. If there, there are one more than one person involved in the data creation or uh, the research project, then the copyright is held jointly between them unless otherwise uh, agreed upon differently. So I think we have gone to the Mentimeter already. So yeah, how you can find out who owns the rights if you don't know. It is not that hard to find out. Um, if you are affiliated to any university or research center, there should be a staff in there who deals with the ethical and legal compliance in research like REOs, or you can find it looking at the applicable national IP laws or IP policies of uh, your particular organization. Uh, because failure to do so can cause serious issue for the future uses of your research, such as uh, its dissemination, any future related research projects or profits associated with it. So the next uh, issue to consider is the copyright considerations when using social media data. Uh, I'm sure you all are very well aware what social media data is. It is an umbrella term used for um, internet-based or mobile applications that allow users to form online social networks and uh, some of the very popular social media platforms include Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, and I have missed the TikTok, which is, I think, most popular these days, especially in the among the young generation. So the data is usually obtained through the application programming interface, um, commonly known as APIs of the social media platforms. Uh, APIs are provided by social media platforms to enable controlled access to their underlying functions and data. And an API acts as an interface between the social media platform and a consumer of social media data. Um, the Twitter streaming API allows researcher and collecting institutions to obtain tweets generated by users in real time. So, Accessing data through APIs provides the most authentic record of social media information. And uh, social media data available on, the plat plat on these platforms includes individual posts or tweets, what people share on a day-to-day -day basis, how people comment on posts and tweets, show their opinion, behavior, likes, dislikes, visual contents, um, such as photos, videos, interests, their social interactions, networks, and the current trends as well. Um, so these different platforms uh, possess a wide variety of functions and appeal to different audiences. So they all create a byproduct of valuable data about the users who interact with them. So just... Um, couple of questions um, on the Mentimeter again. I'm just... Yeah, here's the code for you to access the Mentimeter. So this is the last activity on the Mentimeter. I should have asked you to leave it open <clears throat> previously.
I can see that people are joining. So just a few more seconds before I go to the question. So just a general point, have you ever been involved in a research that involves social media data? That's that's um, majority of you have not, but a couple of you have said yes, so that's great. So you must be aware of the challenges of using social media data, especially if you plan to share that data. So that's great. Some of you have have used or plan maybe plan to use. So just some reflection. What do you think could be the copyright issues using social media data? So there is no right or wrong answers and the answers are anonymous. So if you would just like to think what could be the issues. Ownership, yeah. Personal data disclosure, yes, that's right. Confusion as to who owns the data, user or platform or other, exactly, that's that's true. Username and personal impacts, participant identity, libel statements, ownership, personal information, ethical approval, yes, that's great, fantastic. Yeah, Tox toxic toxicity. Is it the copyright issue? But that is an issue. Anonymity, yes, that's right. Thank you. Yep, yeah, thank you very much. Let's get back. So yeah, you're right. Um, in terms of the responses you have shared, um, the the terms of use for the most commonly used social media platforms are similar in terms of how they deal with IP rights and um, content is protected by copyright in the same way as books and journals. Whatever you post on these platforms is considered your creation, your content. So these platforms clearly states that the users have copyright for their own content. You are the copyright holder of your tweets or Facebook posts, though you are the copyright holders, but when you agree to the terms and conditions to create your account on these platforms, you sign an agreement that gives the site a license to freely use the work for a variety of purposes, including an opportunity for researchers to access the data for academic research. So researchers using social media data need to abide by the terms and conditions of the platforms or API developers. The terms and conditions of these uh, platforms or API developers play an important role in terms of the future uses of data, such as publishing or archiving. I'll be using Twitter as an example and it is the most widely used um, social media platform across the world in, and it is relatively easy for researchers to collect data from it. So as an open platform, the majority of posts are available to public view and researchers can collect large numbers of tweets in a very short period of time um, via the platform's API. However, it is a uh, valuable source for research, but um, researchers do face challenges when it comes to publishing social media data for uh, future use. Um, for example, when a researcher or research team has created a data set, it is not usually possible for them to deposit that data set uh, with a repository or an archive or um, collecting institution for reuse. For example, 
Twitter policy restricts from sharing any data they obtain from the API and also from storing data in a cloud. The policy does allow the archiving of tweet IDs, um, which is the unique number given to an individual tweet or user ID, the <clears throat> number assigned to Twitter account holders. So others, other researchers could use the tweet IDs to recreate a data used in a previous study, but only if Twitter continues to provide access to this historical data. So it is not ideal, but at least it provides a better solution than sharing no information at all about data sources for published studies. And um, besides this, there may be another challenge. Researchers use different methods to access social media data from APIs, different tools, different platforms, different types of APIs even. So different re resellers with different services, which create very diverse types of data sets. So individual researchers use different methods to clean or organize their data as well as different tools and methods for analyzing their data. And um, in addition to this, the IDs associated with a data set information about how the raw, raw data was collected and how it was cleaned is also important and will be required for recreating a data set or understanding how and why it has been altered. So. The archiving of data set identifier is more effective if the processes used to create them are also documented. And um, Twitter places a particular restriction on the form in which tweets may be published, requiring certain items of data to be retained in the published form. So the forced retention of this material may pose a challenge to privacy. For example, if you need to quote some tweets when publishing, you, you cannot anonymize the tweets because Twitter does not allow modification in the content. You need to use the full tweet as it is. So these are some of the challenges uh, when you use uh, social media data. So here I have added a useful checklist by uh, UCL, though it is for the reviewers, but can be useful for the researchers who wish to use social media data. Um, I have added a link that you can access when you get the slides. So another important point to keep in mind is the copyright in the international context. So just for a few seconds break, if you would like to share in the chat in which country you are carrying out your research. If you would like to share, otherwise that's fine. UK. Thank you, Sonia. So thank you, Maji. Yeah, that's fine. So both of them, um, so far we have seen that Saudi Arabia, that's Amal, thank you. That's, that's fantastic. All right, so Veronica, you are using, uh, you are carrying out your research in the UK, but using social media data from European countries. That's, that's, I think fantastic. Then global globally, you are doing that's great. Thank you very much for your responses. Uh, <clears throat> okay, another response uh, globally. So it's it's uh, I think diverse uh, attendees carrying out research um, globally or in some specific countries outside the UK. So that's great. So um, every country has its own copyright laws, but over the years, there has been extensive global harmonization of copyright laws through treaties and trade agreements. And um, these treaties and agreements establish minimum standards for all participating countries. And um, this system leaves room for local variation. One of the most uh, 
significant international agreement is the Berne Convention. I hope I have pronounced it um, correctly, though it was signed originally in 1886, but it has since been revised and amended on several occasions. And um, this treaty lays out several fundamental principles upon which all participants when participating countries have agreed. And one of those principles is national treatment, which means that all countries must give foreign works the same protection they give to the works created within their borders, assuming the other country is a signatory. So besides this, the minimum standards also include the type of work protected, duration, limitations, and uh, so on. So the national laws are built on the similar basic standards, but there may be variation on a country level in terms of type of work that is protected, duration for which it is protected, and what exceptions are allowed. So minimum terms such as life plus 50 years in terms of duration. This is an interesting map which gives you an idea of differences in Have a look at the map from a continental perspective and we can clearly see patterns of same duration with small exceptions. Um, for example, in Europe, America and Canada, most countries adhere to life plus 70 years. In comparison, in Africa, we can see the continent is dominated by life plus 50, with few exceptions. And Mexico stands out and is actually the only country to adopt life plus 100 years. So this gives you an idea that although um, majority of the countries are signatory of the B Bernie Convention, but there is a local variation in terms of um, copyright duration. So they do follow the basic um, rules, but uh, with some variation. So <clears throat> if you plan to use um, secondary data, always ensure that you consider these questions, who the copyright holder of the data set is, can you use these data sets and in what way are you allowed to archive and publish them in a data repository? If not, you may need to seek uh, permission to distribute material you do not own because if permission is not granted, you may need to remove copyright variable, variables or any material um, before publishing or sharing. Uh, copyright law does allow certain exceptions. For example, you are allowed to copy limited extracts of works. When the use is um, non-commercial research or private study, however, in the context of data sharing, researchers are not allowed to share the secondary data unless they are allowed to do so. The majority of um, uses of copyright materials continue to require permission from copyright owners, so you should be careful when considering whether you can rely on an exception, but if in doubt, you should seek advice. Finally, do remember that the details of the provisions will be subject to national law, and while most will be similar, details will vary from country to country. Uh, for example, users of copyright works based in the UK are subject to the specific exceptions to copyright outlined in the UK's copyright laws, and um, uh, each country will have its own exceptions to copyright, so, uh, which are likely to vary from country to country. So users in one country will be able to reproduce copyright work under the copyright exception in ways that... Um, users in other countries will not. So always check the national law. So I have added a copyright scenario here. Um, a, a researcher, imagine a researcher has used secondary data sources for a research project and he intend, intend to share his data for future reuse. He has used World Bank and Microsoft Academics um, 
as he has used secondary sources, he should check whether he is allowed to share the data he has used from these sources. So he needs to check the terms and conditions of use of these sources. And the terms and conditions on the websites are usually, usually at the bottom of the website, but sometimes you have to find that out or write to them. So I have added the screenshot from the World Bank open data here on the slide. Here you can see that it is mentioned that there is no restriction on sharing the data with the third parties. So that's okay. The information or data he has taken from the World Bank, um, he, he can share it in any repository for future researchers. However, terms of using Microsoft Academics says that you cannot modify, distribute, publish these. Um, and in order to publish this, you may need to obtain permission. So uh, for this data, the researcher needs to get back to them and ask them for the copyright clearance and obtain permission. Uh, so that the data can be shared for future reuse. So always check this if you plan to deposit your data for future use. Here on this slide, I have added link to our web page on copyright and access levels. And I have also added a useful template called variable information Lo log. Um, for data sets being deposited, that includes secondary data resources. Researchers are advised to prepare this log describing the resources. This uh, allows others to understand and use data correctly. And it also ensures that repositories can check the appropriate terms and conditions applicable to onward sharing. And uh, it should include variable name, source, how the, it was collected, brief description, any restrictions, or, and so on. There are some more resources I've added here uh, in case you are interested. Yes, another list. So yeah, I have added some copyright scenarios onto the Padlet. Uh, I think Gail would add the link to the Padlet into the chat. Thank you, Gail. So the link to access the Padlet is into the chat. I have added five scenarios here. You can start. Uh, who do you? Uh, what do you think is the right right issue in each? I'll give you um, ten minutes or so, and then we will discuss each of these scenarios. It's anonymous, so feel free. I hope it is anonymous. Feel free to add. So the copyright in a, the first, let's go, go to the scenarios. I'll just refresh it in case we have more responses. So I'll go th uh, to the first scenario first. Uh, where I have asked uh, you to imagine a research project where a researcher is collecting diaries, given this is diaries, participants might wish to publish memoirs in the future. How would you ensure copyright issues here in this? And there are some responses. Uh, I'll just quickly go through each response and then get back to you. While you were uh, writing um, to these scenarios, I have tried to answer some of the questions in the Q&A. And if there are any other questions, please feel free to write if uh, I'm not clear because I have uh, 
type my answer instead of on uh, i just make use of the time uh instead of going at the to the q and a at the end i thought that while we while you are doing this i can just try to answer if you are not clear just um add it again to the q and a box and i'll go through those questions again after after this so So Majid, so it was not anonymous. Sorry about that. I thought it's anonymous. So you are confused with the questions. Okay, that, that is completely fine. Sometimes um, if you are a quantitative researcher, then you are not very familiar um, with the call research. So it, it's the question is about the copyright issue um, in diary data where someone writes a daily diary and they just want to publish that diary, how you could ensure that um, the copyright is um, addressed. So in this scenario, you can use the information obtained in the discussions for your own research. However, when it comes to data sharing or publishing, you need to obtain permission from the participants to share their personal information. So you need to obtain consent to share the information and permission to use the data for future reuse. So this is the diary data which you have used, which someone can use for their own research, but if they have plan to share this data that they have used for their own research so that future researchers can use this data, then they need to ensure that they have consent in place as well as the permission, copyright clearance in place to share their data because um, the information, uh, they, they are the owner who have written the diary. So the second one is the copyright of the information available online. So here's a scenario. Uh, where a researcher studies how health issues around obesity have been reported in the media in the last 10 years and freely available newspaper websites and library resources are used to obtain articles on this topic. And then they are copied into a database and coded according to various criteria for content analysis. So can the researcher use such public data without breaching copyright? Can the database be archived and shared with other researchers? So let's go to your responses. Exactly, yeah. So now you get it. That's right, thank you very much. Um, even though the articles obtained are freely available online, they might still be subject to copyright. While such information can be used for personal research purposes, the articles cannot be archived unless permission is obtained from the newspaper, otherwise this would breach copyright and terms and conditions of all data used should be checked before the archiving process begins. Just, just remember um, the screenshots I, I have shown you about the World Bank and the Microsoft ed academics, um, the data obtained from these two sources, you need, you always need to check the terms and conditions. And um, publicly available information does not mean that you, you, you can do anything uh, with the information. So, the third one is uh, copyright of archive data. Here, a researcher uses international social survey program data with, obtained from DSIS, um, a repository, um, Institution for Social Sciences in Germany. These data are available to re registered users. Okay, let's go to the responses. Can this database be placed on the researcher's website? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you for the responses. Yeah, that's all of all the responses are to the point. Although the ISSP data are available for free to all registered 
um, researchers. This does not mean that the data can be published on a website and made available to others. The data can be incorporated into a database and used for personal analysis. And uh, before this data set is placed on a website, permission must be sought from the data owner. So let's go to the fourth one. Um, that's right. The researcher should technically have cleared copyright before transcription, and if the work is for personal use only, this can probably be disregarded. But if the newly constructed data set is to be archived and disseminated, copyright clearance will need to be gained from the copyright holder. So the last one, copyright of open data obtained from the UK data service. Yeah, exactly. Although IP ownership will depend on national law and individual institution policies, most universities recognize as a general principles that students um, can own the copyright in the work they produced. So there may be circumstances where ownership has to be shared or assigned to the university or anyone else, like, for example, the funder or uh, the in, uh, the context of sponsored students. So yeah, you you exactly you're right. So yeah, they, they can. Some of the universities or research centers, they do claim ownership of any IP that is generated um, by the students. So yeah, best practice is uh, always to check with the institutional policies to, de to determine who owns the IP in the produced work. So the fifth one is the open data one. So yeah, that, that is exactly the case. They can mention, they can attribute but they do need, even if it is under Creative Commons licenses, they need to check, as I have shown you in the slide, that there are three types of uh, Creative Commons, which license was uh, attached to the data set. They, they need to check that whether it, it is CC by sheer alike, CC by non-commercial or whatever. So they do need to check that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let's go back to, yeah, so this is the, thank you very much for your responses and that that was great. You are all, I think, um, you get it, uh, what I wanted to convey today. So uh, you can register for the UK Data Service following this link or QR code and for any other training events um, by, uh, using this QR code for our future training events or just to access our past events as well. There are slides on our website for the past events and YouTube recording as well. So thank you very much uh, for today. And this is my email address. And then there is an email address for the shared uh, mailbox where you can, I'm very happy to answer if you have any project related queries, you can always email me.